So welcome everybody to the Astrobiology and Exoplanets panel, What Should We Be Looking For? So just, I'm going to introduce our panel speakers in just a moment, but I thought that I would just introduce this topic a little bit to get, switch our brains to be thinking a little bit about this topic. So I got a couple of little slides and just a little bit I wanted to say. So what is the likelihood that life is elsewhere? So according to scientists like Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking, it would be improbable for life not to exist elsewhere. The Earth is not actually that unique in its position in the universe. And you know, given the consistency of the physical laws of nature, there's a high probability that there are billions of Earth-like, Earth-sized planets orbiting in habitable zones around stars. So what would this life look like? It might very, look very much like bacteria that we have on Earth, or perhaps extremophiles that we find on Earth, like the giant tube worm that lives in high sulfide vents deep in the ocean. Or maybe it would look like this really adorable microorganism called the tardigrade, or water bear, that happens to be actually able to withstand extreme temperatures, pressure, and radiation. So awesome little creature, huh? Don't you want one in your house? But what would the appearance of the, these extraterrestrial organisms look like? It would depend very much on their, of their environment. They would evolve to be suitable for their environment. So if it was a wet environment, maybe this artistic representation would be suitable. If there was a possibility for airborne creatures, maybe it would look something like this, if they're more complex than the bacteria we were just discussing. Or if there were extremes of sulfur, gravity, high or low temperature, they would evolve to be suitable for their environment. But the big question that we all want to know is, would it be intelligent life? So we have a tendency to visualize what these extraterrestrials would look like as being humanoid in appearance. And in some cases, we can envision they may even be smarter than we are, and that we may actually have something to learn from them. And how would we recognize this life? Well, we're doing our best to have radio wave detection set up and telescopes and sampling as we send our probes further into the universe. But life as we know it is carbon-based. So one of the important things to look for is water and carbon and biomolecules. And we do indeed have some water-containing planets in our solar system and beyond. In any event, this is a fascinating question. And I, we will really look forward to our panelists talking some more about this. So I would like to introduce each of them and then let them have one or two minutes to begin talking about the broad question that we're discussing today. So you don't have your name tag on. Matthew. So let me introduce Matthew. He is an education program specialist at NASA Goddard Space Flight and the Institute for Space Studies. He has 22 years of diverse leadership, administrative, and science teaching experience, including working as a consultant to schools and media orgs. His work for NASA includes 10 years as a prestigious NASA NEET, which stands for Near Earth Asteroids Tracking Educator, and he has published widely in multiple science fields and has numerous awards for his scientific teaching. Next to him is Caleb Sharp, who's the Director of Astrobiology at Columbia University. He works in the field of exoplanetary science and astrobiology and writes extensively about science for the popular audience. One of the ultimate goals of his research is to find planets that could harbor recognizable life and to de detect the presence of that life. Then we have Peter Raymond, who is the CEO of Human Condition. And thank you, Peter, again, for allowing us to co-opt your space even before it was technically ready so that we could have this event here. Peter is an innovator and an entrepreneur developing emerging technical applications for more than 29 years. 
he and his team create solutions with significant social impact to problems related to worker safety, food and nutrition, smart build buildings, and renewable energy. Human Condition works with Fortune 500 companies and high impact organizations to create rapid responses to organizational and product development. And last but not least, we have Linda Soul from the Center of Climate Systems Research and also Goddard in International Space Studies at Columbia University. Linda's research combines geological info and climate model simulations to reconstruct livable environments on the ancient Earth. Then she applies what we learn thinking about the ancient Earth to our hunt for habitable planets in the solar system and beyond. And she's also an active climate science educator. So now I'd like to give each panelist an opportunity to comment about, about the main question for our panel, the broad question, what should we be looking for for life further in the solar system and beyond. We'll start with you, sir. Thank you, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, from, from, not on. am I not on? Is he on? Are we? Talk, talk, talk. Thanks, that's a great question. Um, one that my colleagues are much more uh, apt to answer definitively. My role is to uh, lead the education efforts for the Goddard Space Flight Center here in New York to bring students and organizations and nonprofits and museums to try and answer those big questions. And if you're interested in studying those types of things, I would, in a student, I would be the person to contact to coordinate internship opportunities for you to answer those big questions. And while I have many wonderful opinions about that question, I'm gonna defer that to the, the experts. That's, that's too bad. I, I was hoping someone would answer the question before me, so I didn't have to. So I think, you know, what should we be doing? Well, I think uh, in, in very simple terms, we should be casting as wide a net as possible. And in part, that is because we have to admit that we don't know for sure that life elsewhere in the universe will match the template of life here exactly, although it does seem that complex uh, chemistry based around carbon is likely to be ubiquitous. We don't know that for a fact. And um, I think the other piece of it is, even if we begin to see evidence for life elsewhere, for example, the signs of chemistry that could have been emplaced by uh, organisms on Mars or Europa or Enceladus, or signs of uh, uh, biosignature, biomarker molecules in the atmospheres of distant exoplanets, we then have a big, big scientific challenge to decode that, to tell us what's going on really, what's happening at a microscopic level. Because life as we know it is small, the universe is big, planets are big. And the kind of data we expect to get, unless something like a tardigrade walks across the view of our camera or a microscope, which would be wonderful. Right? If you go to Enceladus and you find a tardigrade uh, walking around, that would be fantastic, although it might just have come from the Earth. So I think, you know, what do we have to do? We have to think very carefully about the nature of big data. We have to think carefully about how we decode relatively basic data to interpret it in the, in the to interpret what must be an underlying complex system. There are a lot of very interesting data challenges, and there are also challenges about extending our imaginations about the nature of biochemistry and what, it's, what is necessary to create a living system. I'll stop there. I could go on, but I'll stop. So I think if you look at the ability to set up conditions for success, right, because that's what we're looking for is, you know, it's, you can search endlessly, but if you can start to narrow what makes sense. So if looking at what do we know from uh, terrestrial-based extremophiles, What's high, what's low, what can exist in a, a pool at 13,000 feet or uh, near a uh, volcanic vent at the bottom of the ocean. You know, you'll see a shrimp actually swimming in a volcanic vent, which you would think that would make dinner, 
The difference is it's somehow able through chemistry and evolution to survive through that. I think if we look at whether it be bacteria uh, or even looking at what we would know as synthetic biology, understanding where the best place to understand how are you going to put something in an environment that's going to be very harsh, maybe has very different energy needs, uh, very different protection mechanisms, often things we see that looks like bacteria or virus, and understand that that may be the first exploration in it, maybe getting away from the idea of the anthropomorphized, you know, little green man, you know, from a general understanding and really focus on the, what is, what does life actually mean? Could it be algae? Could it be a future form of some kind of, uh, literally a, a organic goo? possibly where we came from. And I think starting there and not trying to figure out, all right, if there's so advanced they can talk back to us and we can talk to them. Let's start maybe a little earlier because we're not that much of evolved species to actually take claim to know everything. Okay, um, am I on? Yes. So um, I think this is a really exciting time to be doing this kind of research and the the work that I do, I think, is, is somewhere in between the broad scope that Caleb was talking about and the, the scale that Peter was talking about. Um, we would love to have missions that um, go to the other worlds in our system to actually look for the microbial life um, and, and see if we can find something similar to home. That would be great. I'd love to see that happen. Um, but we're also building telescopes that look a long way away. And how do we understand, how do we start to interpret what we see through those telescopes? How would we have any sense that these worlds might be habitable in a way that, that we can relate to? And um, the work that I do basically uses snapshots of Earth's past history when we know there was life, but it was very different from today. And we use sophisticated um, climate simulations to try to reconstruct what the whole world looks like, um, going beyond the, the small environment, which we would never be able to, to see from afar, unfortunately. Um, but to get some sense of the global scale of how is life um, influencing the, the global environment, and what information can we take from that to then apply to the things that we see from afar. Um, and I think the next 10 to 20 years is going to be really exciting. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Uh, Alicia, are you here? Do you have any questions? Because we got 20 minutes? OK, wow, we're moving at a warp speed here. This is totally awesome. So that actually gives me time to, to uh, throw in while I read the, some of the burning issues that I already know are in everyone's mind as an opening question for any of the panel members who feels like they want to take it on. And one of those questions is, has extraterrestrial life ever been to the Earth? And if so, what do we know about that? So go ahead, good luck. <laughs> so who would like to take it on? I'll give that a shot. I'll give that a shot. Um, well, it depends on what kind of life you're talking about. So it is conceivable that um, life has existed on Mars in the past and has already visited the Earth. And I don't mean people showing up in spacecraft, but in form of uh, microbial life. There is a lot of debate in the community that studies origins of life about whether early Mars was a better potential incubator for life than the Earth. We know that Earth and Mars have exchanged material many, many times over the last four billion years. We can find pieces of uh, Mars on the Earth in form of Martian meteorites that were ejected during asteroid impacts in the past on Mars, and the same must have happened in reverse. Um, so, so there's a bit of a joke in the community about whether we're all Martians or uh, all the Martians are all Earthlings. But have we been visited by something more sophisticated? I, I simply do not know. Anybody else want to take that one on? It's really a fascinating question. Well, I, you know, I think the, the question of uh, when and where life started in the solar system is an intriguing one. And often we think about Mars as a place to start. And I suspect it's because we can see the surface of Mars today as it pretty much looked like billions of years ago. So we have a chance to actually explore an ancient environment today. Um, but there are some 
compelling reasons to think that Mars might have been just too far away and too cold um, for life to have a start there. And so we might actually need to be thinking about life beginning here on Earth and possibly making it to Mars. And I also have a colleague who works on early Venus who would like to argue that maybe that was even the better place to begin. So maybe we're Venusians and not Earthlings or Martians. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of work to consider. Um, very intriguing question. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to take that one on? I think the thing that captivates my attention is, is how similar all the principles of life and science are as we look farther out into the universe. And again, I'm not the, the expert on those principles, but more of an observer in a, that all the various building blocks of life exist elsewhere. And it's reasonable to conclude that possibly those, those blocks have come together somewhere else. And I, I find that intriguing. Um, so I think it's, anything's possible. You want to make a comment? I just, I think um, we have to have a very high level of hubris to think that we are the only ones and we kind of self-organized and came from this uh, understanding of science. And I think it comes down to, the answer to the question is, there hasn't been evidence that says otherwise yet. And I think a lot of us on this panel are interested in finding that evidence. Excellent. Thank you. We have a couple of really good questions here, so we're going to try the next one. And some of them are related, but this one says, what should we be cautious of in the exploration of life on other planets? Is there something to be scared of with concerns to astrobiology? Anybody ready to take that one on? Well, I know that there are, there are actually protocols in place right now to try to keep us from basically infecting potentially habitable environments elsewhere. It's, it's one of the reasons why some of the Mars missions have been very careful about uh, their choice of landing sites to not land close to maybe some of the best spots for preserving life because we're afraid of contamination in that direction. If you're a sci-fi fan, you know about the Andromeda strain, which <laughs> comes back to, to haunt us. Um, hopefully that wouldn't happen. Um, but I think that's um, part of the great unknown, is that we don't know what other life is out there, and we don't know how those life forms would interact with ours. We will just have to wait and see. Yeah, I, I agree completely with that. And the, just as an interesting factoid, uh, you know, the challenge of making sure that we don't contaminate the universe is enormous. And to give you an example of that, in the last few years, it's been discovered that in the world's clean rooms, where spacecraft like the, the, the Mars missions are ultimately cleaned up and swabbed and, and irradiated, uh, the, the environment in those clean rooms has led to a certain amount of natural selection uh, so that there are uh, bacteria, species of bacteria that love living in clean rooms and because we've wiped out all their competitors they've done incredibly well and they're very hard to detect using conventional bioassay methods they don't grow in a petri dish um, so you know it's interesting that we should absolutely be cautious and i think as linda says it's us that we, we may be the biggest problem and it's not just destroying some pristine ecosystem somewhere else we want to know whether there was anything there and if we go and contaminate it that's a real problem I think it's interesting when you look, I read an article this morning on the way here uh, that a couple of scientists bought porcini, dried porcini mushrooms uh, and they found three new species of mushrooms while they were testing it from the grocery store, which shows that we really don't know anything, right? No matter how much the science, we're just not there. So I think if looking at, you know, I, looking at a threat, looking at what that could be, I mean, you could have pathogens that are so far our comprehension of what we even know is biology and vice versa to the contamination, or to turn the flip side, you could find massive cures. You could find, you know, you could find interesting pieces of life that put together different building blocks of amino acids that we've just never even contemplated. And I think that's where the, the beauty in, in this search is, is really understanding not only what is the, the particle or the microbe or the actual biome, but how does it open our minds to think well past what we've been comfortable doing? What happens when it goes well past five senses? What if there's 4,000 senses? You know, the, the visible light spectrum is this tiny little piece in radiation, 
right? We have the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, light, one could say, is fast sound. Sound is slow light. You know, we know so little on that side. And I think that's ultimately, it's not even so much about the, the thing. How do we open up our minds to actually perceive what could it be, which is going to change our way that we actually search? So related to that, why don't we talk for a moment a little bit about what would life be based on or look like, as you're saying, if it was not similar to ours, if it was not a carbon structure as, a, as sort of the initial basis. I know that there are some theories out there that you know, we don't necessarily need a water environment, that maybe liquid hydrocarbons would be suitable for some other form of life form. Does anybody want to talk about what that life form might be like? Some of the, the basic characteristics of life are, you know, does the potential organism have the ability to maintain metabolism? Does it have the ability to acquire nutrients in whatever form those are? Does it have the ability to maintain a stable environment in, in homeostasis, uh, meaning balance? Can it balance and maintain and regulate itself? Um, and does it have the ability to have internal conditions? So I think those are some of the basic characteristics. And I think as you look at different concepts of science and different elements and different matter, that, that could potentially align itself in many different ways. And looking at, you know, the idea of, so if you take the kind of anthropomorphic view of life, right? So we're these kind of pretty fragile bags of meat. We use a lot of calories to eat. We use a lot of calories to breathe. You know, I actually have to use muscles to breathe. But imagine you're an organism who just absorbs energy, right? There's, there's a transference. So your efficiency of energy consumption to output is very different. Uh, looking at different gravitational fields, right? That's going to totally change what the, the structure of a species looks like. Things we know even as osmosis could totally change based on chemistry that, you know, we have our periodic table. I have a feeling that's not the complete set. Right? There's going to be chemistry that we don't even know, even properties, phase change, solids to liquids to glass to plasma, but so much further beyond that. I think that, again, it sparks the imagination of what life could actually be. So, so I'm, 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 I'm going to be a little bit sort of uh, devil's advocate or, or, yes. or poke back at that. I, you know, I, I totally appreciate the, the sense of the wonder and possibility, and I think we absolutely have to keep our minds open to that. You know, there are certain laws of physics that we've got to probably obey no matter where we are in the universe as far as we Human can tell. Human identified laws of physics. Well, Human no, identified. Yeah, no, absolutely, sure. So there are limits. But now we're stretching into, into some interesting uh, space in terms of imagination and physics. So, you know, to come to, to questions about, um, you know, energy use and the types of chemistry. So I... I don't really like to say this because I would like to think that there are truly unimaginable, strange and crazy things out there in the universe, but it is true that um, carbon as an atom uh, in terms of the types of bonds, the molecular bonds it can make in all the environments that we are aware of in the universe in terms of thermodynamic environments and temperature, um, pressure and so on, really is remarkable. It is incredibly versatile. And everywhere we look in the cosmos, from nearby to uh, spectroscopy of, of very distant galaxies, that are essentially the light left them 10 billion years ago, we see um, molecules that 80% of the molecules in interstellar space are based around carbon. Um, and they're precursors to more complex molecules that we see in life. So, I, you know, I, we don't know, but I suspect that if life is a phenomena that requires a certain level of complexity, which I think is probably true, you know, to get that complexity may be very, very difficult via anything except the kind of molecular chemistry that we're aware of. That doesn't mean you couldn't use a different set of specific molecules, right? There are a lot more amino acids out there than the 21 that, that we're composed of. Um, so I, you know, I kind of veer. I would love for there to be, you know, energy-based organisms or crystalline organisms out there. My suspicion is that the way that complexity works in the universe, as, again, as far as we know, so I'm, I'm willing to admit that, um, you know, it's going to be 
the, the root chemistry is going to be similar. The really fascinating question to me is, what can you do with that that we, we haven't imagined yet? Um, I, ju I just wanted to add that um, it is really intriguing to think about the, the full spectrum of possibilities of different kinds of organisms. But I think the reality is that unless we run into it face to face, so to speak, um, we won't understand that we're looking at a living thing if it's that different from us. Um, we, in fact, we might just be staring at it and, and it looks like a rock or something else. Um, so, probably, at least as far as, as remote sensing is concerned, we need to focus more on life as we know it. And um, there is a role for um, work in the lab and synthetic life to try to understand what some of those other possibilities might be so that we can eventually go look for them if we're successful in creating something different. Um, but it, it, it sounds a little... Um, human-centric, but we, we kind of start with, with us. We start with Earth life and go from there. It is a fascinating question. Would we recognize different life if we stepped on it or <laughs> ran into it or breathed it or whatever? Um, there is a question in the audience specifically about uh, some of the new data coming in from the Kepler uh, research experiments. and. In particular, someone is interested about why people are talking about something called an alien megastructure. <laughs> so does anybody want to take on that challenge? I, I can say something about that. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, so it's very interesting. So the Kepler uh, space mission obviously has spent a number of years staring at about 150,000 stars. It's now in a second phase of its mission, but spent several years staring at 150,000 stars looking for minute variations in brightness which can reveal the presence of planets as they transit between us and the parent star. And that's a huge data set and astronomers are still, many astronomers are, are getting careers out of, of going through that data set. Um, the interesting thing is the automated algorithms finding planets, find, they find lots of planets but they ignore peculiar anomalous stuff. There was a, a recent or relatively recent publication where some researchers had found a very anomalous event in the Kepler data, which was a relatively ordinary looking star, a largish star, I believe it's an F star, where the brightness of that star was varying in a very, very strange way. I mean, it would be too complicated to explain right now, but lots of interesting variations that on the one hand looked a little bit like something was passing between us and that parent star, on the other hand looked like absolutely nothing we'd seen before. Now that has been the subject of intense scrutiny since then. We still don't know exactly what's going on. For a while people thought, well maybe we're seeing, maybe, <coughs> oh, here we go, we're back again. It was, it was a transit. Um, maybe we're seeing uh, cometary material that is very dark and spread out across a large region, but then when we looked with other instruments looking at infrared emission from that system, that didn't match, and so on and so on. So then somehow someone said to a journalist, well, you know, if among all the possibilities, it's possible it's an alien megastructure. It's the remnants of some alien civilization or a purposefully built uh, mega structure, a Dyson sphere or something, and that kind of stuck in people's heads, understandably. Right, because that would be pretty extraordinary. So right now, that the star has been nicknamed Tabitha's star after the name of uh, the, the researcher who, who spent the most time looking at it, and it is still the subject of intense scrutiny. There, there are ground-based telescope programs studying it right now. We don't know what the hell is going on <laughs> around that star. So it, the interesting thing to me about that is that we're at a point where the technology for astronomy, for example, is sufficiently advanced that, and sufficiently high fidelity that we have to take seriously now. For, I think for the first time ever, when we see truly anomalous things, we have to ask, on the list of possibilities, there should be that item that says, you know, product of civilization or product of intelligence. Um, and so we're in an interesting time. Those things are starting to bubble up. 
Yeah, I, I would say definitely, because even just thinking about the planets that Kepler has identified and some of the other um, missions, how often do we find ourselves saying, we had no idea that there could be a planet that looked like that. You know, that, that happens almost on a regular basis. You know, the, the whole concept of hot Jupiters, for example, these gas giant planets that are so close into their stars, they're raging hot and they orbit around the star within 10 days or something like that. That is so far beyond our experience here in the solar system. We could not have imagined it beforehand. And we keep uncovering these things. And so I, I do think that we, we have to look at all the data that comes in with an open mind. Does anybody else want to comment? Well, just a, a, a side note is, you know, here in about a year, NASA is going to launch the James Webb Telescope. And that is, will be the most powerful telescope we've ever had and is going to see things we've never seen. I don't know if it's going to answer all these awesome questions. I'm, sh I'm sure it will create many, many new questions. But it's going to give us a whole new vantage point and perspective on what's out there. So you may want to take a look at the James Webb Telescope and that development uh, and start thinking about all its capabilities. So this is not really a plant, but one of the questions from the audience is, if we had a billion dollars to spend on astrobiology research, where would we spend it? Anybody want to throw uh, the next innovation idea out there, the next center? So I think keeping investments in uh, telescopes of different forms, whether optical or other uh, spectrum-based instruments, but the reality is when you're on a boat and you pull a telescope and you look at land, you can identify its land. You didn't get there yet. I think we, in a billion dollars is nothing in this scheme. We need to actually invest in figuring out how to push a little bit further out so that we reduce the distance of what we're instrumenting. Right, because you put more instruments out, you can look at different uh, uh, science and processing those data sets, but there's a certain point proximity matters. You know, it wasn't very long ago that we didn't know why we got sick and a microscope was invented. Well, after the microscope was invented, that allowed everything else to happen. I think we're in that very nascent space uh, where we can see some stuff, don't quite know what it means. We can build some hypotheses. We can see a star wobble, so maybe that we think there's a planet there. But the reality is that's a very, very, very long way away. And I think we need to put core investment into understanding how to bring that closer or increasing instrumentation besides things like, oh, just a bigger telescope. Yeah, I mean, to be, to be honest, if I had a billion dollars, which, which isn't much these days for building things like space telescopes, and I didn't care what happened to it, I would probably give it to Yuri Milner and the Breakthrough Starshot project. You know, he's only, only spending 100 million, which is not going to get anyone to Alpha Centauri. Throw a billion in there, and you're going to see some really interesting things happen. Not necessarily to get to Alpha Centauri, which is going to cost probably a trillion dollars, but in terms of solar system exploration, the same technology, scaled down and, and perhaps more practical and, and tractable, could take us to every part of the solar system sort of on a weekly basis, which would be extraordinary. That would, that would be a step towards what you're talking about. It would be opening up the cosmos. It would be bringing everything closer to us. So we have about one minute left in the panel. And I was wondering, does anybody have any go-backs? Any more comments? We have one more question, if you don't. But I always like to give people a chance to say more. I just wanted to say briefly, if, if there are students, either you're in high school or an undergraduate or a graduate student or a postdoc, NASA has internship opportunities for you to work with the brilliant people like these and, and try to answer these big questions. So if you're interested in that, please go to intern.nasa.gov. Anybody else want to say something? Um, so Jancy was speaking earlier about uh, creativity and how important it is. And it's as important in designing research as it is in designing an app. Um, the work that uh, my colleagues and I are doing right now involve people from a whole bunch of different scientific disciplines. It's not easy. We have to learn how to talk to each other, share vocabulary. But the work that is ultimately going to come out of this is going to be amazing. And just one note, I am actually taking the seat for Bill Diamond, who's the new CEO and president of SETI. Uh, I was with Bill on Monday. 
uh, and I just want to take a shout out for SETI because that's been a lot of the work has been done both between listening but also in the Cardinal Sagan uh, Center for Astrobiology where there's been a lot of research and a lot of great researchers who've been working for a lot, a lot of NASA folks but bringing this stuff together and I think SETI uh, as not only an institute but a practice area is going to change radically over the next five years. Did you have anybody else? We're pretty much out of time. Final comment? I'll just say, you know, this, this is the age of disruption in terms of technology, in terms of ideas, and I think academia is slowly catching up to that. And I think it's an age, especially for a topic like this, looking for life in the universe, we need all the good ideas we can get. So don't be shy. You know what? Reach out. We're, some of us are listening. Well, thank you. I think that's a great way to end up today's panel. And I just want to thank all the panelists for contributing your thoughts on this really fascinating topic. So thank you.